Welcome to Book to Where Two Guys Tell You About the Books They're Reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Olivia Snudden. Uh, so if you're tuning in this week because you thought it was going to be a book review, we have had a slight change in schedule. Mostly, uh, happy birthday, Rob. Hey, thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> it was one of the changes we made. But um, and I've been kind of vague about this episode for a few weeks. So we have an interview. Um, if you've seen this in a link somewhere, you've probably already seen it. It is with Mark Z. Danielewski. Did I say that right, Rob? I believe you. you nailed it. Perfect. So um, 19 years in the making, 19 years ago, I first read House of Leaves and said, God, I'd love to talk to this guy, but I didn't have a podcast then. And then, you know, whatever, 10 years, 11 years goes by, I started a podcast. I was like, God, I'd love to talk to this guy. And here it is. It's finally happening. I am ridiculously excited about this. Yeah, it's almost like we haven't already interviewed him. <laughs> almost, almost. But Rob will tell you that I was very excited and probably a little nervous beforehand, too. So, um, yeah. Not a lot of fanfare. Here's uh, here's Mark C. Danielewski talking to us uh, about the little blue kite and a bunch of other stuff. Mark, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on with us tonight. Thanks, thanks for doing this. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, uh, seeing I'm already stumbling over my words. This is the benefit of being the guy that edits this. I can sound as dumb as I I want when we're talking. All right. So. By the way, I'm I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of stumbling over words. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer in all that they con- contain and suggest. I mean, I think there's all sorts of miracles in those stumbles. I think I think that's where it all starts. It's the most important place to kind of take a look at. Like, what are what's all of that that's stirring right beneath you know your soon to come articulations? I, it's it's. It's it's a magical place. I try to live there as much as possible. Oh man, this interview is going to be amazing. Um, so, so to kick this off, uh, we thought we'd just have you do a quick uh, explanation of um, your new book, The Little Blue Kite, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, it's uh, it's my shortest book to date. It's uh, it clocks in at an amazing ninety six pages, uh, and you can read it in about a half an hour. Uh, but there are also other ways to read it, which can shorten that time down to 12 minutes and even around three minutes. And it's designed for children uh, uh, as young as uh, as infants, preverbal, really sort of an occasion for uh, an adult to read something um, to their little one or also entertain their little one with a lot of fluttering pages. Uh, but it's also it also is is suited for kids that are a bit older, a bit more you know verbally agile, who may want to j- jump from from one rainbow word to another and and really kind of experience at least another version of the story um, very quickly. Uh, or parents and children can actually engage the whole story and discuss about discuss what it's what's what it's about and in part it is about what what i sort of jumped in um on about uh stumbling words and and this the sort of the meanings that begin to percolate up before they can even become words uh because it's it's about a about our hero named Kai, who's terribly afraid of flying a little blue kite. And that's all he has to do. All he has to do is overcome this little, little fear. Uh, but what we see is he begins to loft that little blue kite higher and higher is that it's not simply um, the, the act of kite flying, but it's also the act of, of letting go of um, certain concepts, certain rigidities, certain ways of, of framing narratives. And through the course of that great adventure, uh, letting go of those primal fears that can really inhibit um, uh, becoming who we are. Um, so I want to start by saying, and, and uh, it's hard because it's such a short book to really talk about the story, but I will say I'm probably breaking some kind of rule, but my plan this weekend is to read this to my four-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> and quite Fantastic. honestly, I've never, I've never flown a kite. And in reading this, I thought this is going to be a lot of fun. So my plan is, if the weather holds here in the Midwest, um, to actually get a kite and do that. So it, it's interesting because it was, it felt like it was written for a toddler 
then maybe someone just a little older. And then there's really a good adult story in there, too. And um, in, you know, what we'll call Mark Danielewski tradition, right, there's, uh, of course, you know, the, the different ways to read it. So how, how do you how do I say this? Um, what's the launching point for you to tell a story in this kind of non-linear fashion? Well, first I might say that, that in many ways this is a linear book. It just has different linearities. I think non-linear sort of implies a kind of a scattered tale, and I think we can both agree that it's um, all agree that it's For sure. that, that it does have sort of a you know a forward momentum um but i think what you're what you're getting at which is true is that uh as you encounter the different ways to read the book you realize that their focus is different and more importantly their perspective is different and so i don't know what to call that and but i think that's that's what you mean when you say nonlinear. And I think I, cause yes. I've come across this before. It's like, wait, it is linear, but it, it's doing something else. So, you know, the simple example is a very quick read through the, through the book is actually the perspective of the kite. But then the second read through is actually the, per, uh, the pers- from the perspective of Kai who flies the kite. And, and so I think the, for me, the, the, the sort of starting point is, is this kind of understanding of the whole world in a way, a kind of multidimensional kind of resonance of all the parts that, that I'm able to access somehow from all different kinds of angles. And, and, and that, that doesn't come entirely intact, but there is a sensation that, that, that fills me that kind of gives me all these vantage points. I mean, that happened with House of Leaves. It happened with Only Revolutions. I understood how, how both those characters, those 16-year-olds on a road trip, were seeing each other from sort of vastly different places. Um, and here, too, it was kind of this understanding of, of, of the kite's vantage point, the young boy's vantage point, the young boy as he grows into a young man, an older man, and also kind of the world that, that, um, that divides them as well as potentially unifies them. And, uh, and the best I can tell you is, is it, is it kind of a a feeling. And I, I don't know if you want me to get into it, but there is actually, unlike all my books, a real origin story, uh, to the little blue kite. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, it was um, it was on the day of my wedding eve, and I say it that way because my wife and I decided to have a midnight wedding. So we were, I think we'd all we'd been lambasted by our friends for for being such early morning people and we're like, okay, we'll go the whole night. We'll, we'll do it. We'll just, we'll stay up all night. And the ceremony was at midnight and, uh, we got food trucks and we went until, we went until dawn. Um, but that, that, that morning actually preceding, uh, all the events in the ceremony, uh, my, my, my close friends took me out to one of these ridiculous spas and I, and gave me a mud bath. <laughs> And suffice it to say, I was a bit, I was a bit anxious about all the proceedings and there was a lot that had gone into it and, you know, people were flying from all, all over the place in and I, you know, there's all, there's a whole other, I guess, nested set of stories there. Uh, But I was in this mud and I really was not having a pleasant time. I was, I, I, I couldn't really breathe. I was overheating and I felt a kind of panic start to uh, get at me. And I felt like I was going to sort of kill Bill my way out of there. Uh, And then suddenly I had this kite in my head and I was just watching it. And I was 
what's more, I was flying it and I was, I was letting it rise higher and higher and higher. And it came to the moment. It's kind of the one moment I suppose I don't really want to talk about for spoilerish reasons. And I think, you know, the one I'm talking about, whereas there's this just dramatic shift that, you know, took me from the mud to this place that was completely free of all of these kind of corporeal anxieties, you know, future anxieties, and allowed me to, to experience the world in a way that, that, that I had never experienced it up until then. And uh, I was really shocked by this encounter or... Uh, you know, it, it begs for a new terminology, really. And um, and I couldn't forget it. I couldn't let it go, if you will. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the things I told my wife was that I wasn't going to write. I wasn't going to work at all, you know, on our little mini moon that, that followed the, the ceremony. Um, but I told her a bit about what I'd experienced and it kind of kept gnawing at me. And she was like, just just write it, write it down. And some friends of ours had very kindly given us their place um, sort of in the, you know, away from sort of urban commotions. And, uh, and I didn't know it very well, but there were some paper plates lying around in the kitchen. And so I just grabbed them and, and, and took them out on this little balcony they had and just sat down and wrote it in about an hour. And I've never had really a story come to me in, in such sort of a complete form. Now that said, it then took three years to, to increase it, to sculpt it, and to finally whittle it down to sort of the barest elements, not to mention discover all the components, which, you know, which was also a, a long and complicated but gratifying, you know, road of, you know, exploring how to, do, you know, the murk, you know, the, all sorts of textures were kind of created. I was burning stuff, smearing <laughs> stuff, melting stuff, and, you know, kind of working with this material over and over until this aspect of kind of a shared digital environment began to mesh and in some ways not mesh with with the watercolor design, the sort of the simple, you know, um, sort of strokes that 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 create, you know, the hero as well as the kite. And um, not to mention the things that aren't there, for instance, you know, uh, locales were, were more specific. Even the kite string itself was an idea. Like, do we, ha do we have to represent the kite string? And then it became more and more clear that, of course, we're not going to draw the thread because the thread is always is already there. The sort of, you know, the sutras of the text, if you will, that that sort of uh, that 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 connect and don't connect the hero to the, to the kite. Um, and then uh, it was a matter of finishing it, even though I think I've, I think only just in the last week or so have I, have I come to really accept that the, that the book is finished. So this is really the, you know, the first time I've talked about it to tell you the truth when I, yeah. when I felt that it's, that it's complete and free. Well, the first thing I want to say is that the, the story about the origin as you're telling it, and I'm thinking about the story that I read, I was like, this is excellent context for like, you know, the feelings of, of the story that, 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 you know, the different characters and, and stuff have, I was like, this, this makes total sense. Um, so that that's really cool. I, thanks for that story. Um, oh, you're welcome. I totally forgot my follow up. I, oh no, I do. <laughs> so the thing that you the thing that you touched on, which me even before we got on the call, Livius, me and Livius were talking about, was um, the word perspective and um, and and just how you have a unique way of portraying perspective or like giving. Uh, I, I guess maybe like a more fullness to perspective perspective. And so outside of this book, thinking of um, if I remember correctly, 50 year sword, the different characters, mm -hmm. the quotation marks were different colors. 
Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah. So like that's correct. Yeah. Though it's it's those types of things that we don't see in other books that I think just add um, either depth or like more dimension to the way that you approach the story as a reader. And so I, I don't even have a question. I just want to say that that's kind of one of the prevailing themes that I've been thinking about is how perspective seems to be something that you you do a very good job of approaching. Well, thank you. And I, th- I think you are nailing what, what matters a, a great deal to me if we're, or if we're, com- if we're talking about the, the, I guess, the physics of my, of my books. It's, uh, it's almost unerringly uh, consistent in that regard. And, and I do think it, it, it's very similar to, oh, to take a sort of physics metaphor, I suppose, like theory of relativity, you know, the, the, the understanding that, that where we are standing and where we are experiencing something, something in relation to something else that is ex- being experienced by someone, someone else in a different place is fundamental to how this world functions, you know, um, to tiny subatomic particles all the way up to sort of the grand motions of, of, of galaxies. And, uh, and I think one of the, one of the comforts and, and, and perhaps escapes of, of many literatures is that it ignores that um, responsibility to various vantage points. You know, we, we find a certain, cozy familiarity with one voice, you know, we become accustomed to that voice and, uh, it's a wonderful experience. You know, it's the, it's the bedtime story that our parents tell us in, in some ways or that our cultures reiterate, you know, and it, it all, it frames everything very nicely in, in this, in this one particular manner. Um, but the direction I'm going is to sort of say, Hey, that's not actually the narrative of the world we live in. There is no grand, you know, um, uh, annealing, alloying um, voice to give this, this all this coherency, um, which the human mind demands. That in fact we have to start looking more intensely at different vantage points, different perspectives. Um, so it's not really, I'm, it's not really that I, that I add dimensions. I simply reveal the dimensions Mm, that are already there. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Signiconic in which text and image merge to provide the reader with entirely new perspective, which is a lot of what you've talked about, um, I think covered here recently, but there's kind of a third dimension that we want to talk about a little bit and that's the digital medium. So Mm -hmm. Rob and I missed the 50 year sword on its first printing. Um, Mm -hmm. So when it was re-released, we opted. We actually reviewed it here on the podcast. Um, We did the digital versions. Rob had the benefit of owning an Apple device and and got the digital experience. So uh, subsequently, I think, believe only Revolutions after that was also released in a um, sort of interactive digital space. So I think that kind of adds that third layer. Really, I guess what I want to know is, how do you feel about the digital medium and its future specifically for your books and then kind of as a wider, um, you know, in general for, for literature and storytelling? Well, I smiled immediately when you said you checked out the 50 year sword and only revolutions, uh, in the digital Hmm. form. Did you, did you enjoy only revolutions? Did you enjoy the the books that way? Um, So we only only did the 50 year sword. So, and I was, uh, I was saddled with an Android device and a, and a really pretty PDF and Rob got all the full fun stuff on his iPad. Um, cause it was, um, it was an immense amount of work, uh, to bring about both of them, only revolutions in particular, since it, it provides hundreds of road signs for everything that's going on. And, and we were, you know, we, we worked a lot with um, engineers to make sure that it wasn't gender biased. You know, it's easy if it would just been Sam first and then Haley, but we made it sure that both narratives were constantly shifting, which is the purpose of the book. There is no front or, or back to that book, as you know. Um, so for me, it, it's, it's a kind of melancholy, um, a, a kind of ecstatic experience tempered by a great deal of melancholy because it's just not there. Um, in some ways, it's it's a lot. It's it may be due just to 
how the technological industry is going to work for a while or maybe continually, but it it because that industry hasn't stabilized, it makes all of these productions incredibly unstable. So, you know, one one example is that Only Revolutions was was, you know, was sort of keenly anticipated by a lot of academics because they wanted to teach the book um, using the electronic version with all its, its road signs and assists and whatnot. But because it's only available on the Apple, yeah. uh, you know, a, a school can't, you know, mandate that students buy an Apple device. They can go so far as to say you need an electronic device that device that plays certain things, but you can't. They can't say you have to buy this particular product. Um, and the thought was that it, it that the other platforms would catch up and that we would soon be able to migrate to to other devices. But that hasn't happened. And on top of it, the more complicated the endeavor, the more upkeep it requires. As mm-hmm. um, as different systems are updated. So, you know, it becomes this quiet nightmare. And, you know, recently, I, I don't know if you were aware, my, my site, which is kind of a, a modest cyber brick and mortar where, you know, we make announcements about, you know, the tour, or, you know, sell some T-shirts or, or, or whatnot, was hacked. And that sort of cyber vandalism required, you know, you know, weeks of work, we're still putting it all back together and we will get it back together. Uh, but it, you know, it's a huge drag. <laughs> yeah. I, I spent all last week, you know, going through the C panel and, you know, getting out my tech, my text wrangler and starting to like, you know, get into the code to repair things and change passwords and whatnot. And, and, you know, all I really want is a place that we could just sort of like, you know, put put a few mentions and and you know a few little knickknacks. Uh, so just you know, just faced with that kind of of upkeep, you know, where I don't have an IT department or whatnot, um, I you can only imagine magnifying that and 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 seeing how problematic all these other forms are if they're not even going to be viable in in a few years, unless you're willing to pay a certain upkeep and a certain amount of, of kind of, you know, um, modification, you know, modifying, you know, whatever, you know, new things have come out so that your, your, your creation is, is suited for, for new devices and platforms. So I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious. And, and at this point I am sticking pretty close to the book and the PDF and a PDF, which at least seems fairly stable. Um, but I'm always kind of, you know, sort of thrilled by the prospect of maybe trying something else, you know. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's just such a volatile, you know, environment. And, and boy, does it constantly reaffirm just how lasting and enduring the codex <laughs> is, you know. <laughs> um, so go, going back in time a little bit, me and Livius actually attended – um, uh, an appearance you did in Chicago when you were promoting the first volume of the familiar and, um, during the Q and a, um, the, the digital thing came up and, uh, you know, uh, s- some of the stuff I-, I sensed like a little bit of not necessarily sadness, but like maybe the melancholy that you were talking about with, with the problems that presented. And in my mind, I was like, this guy is so pioneering in the way that you know, especially the 50 year sword presented on the Apple devices that it would be awful if you were discouraged because it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, and so (laughs) to hear like those setbacks and stuff, it's like, maybe, maybe it happened way earlier than like technology was, was prepared for or whatever. You know, it reminds me, before House of Leaves came out, I was a um, a plumber's apprentice. And uh, I say plumber's apprentice uh, 
loudly underlined because, you know, people have have reported in the past that I was a plumber and I, I did not reach <laughs> such heights. It was kind of like the sorcerer's apprentice. If you left me alone, <laughs> it was likely that the basement would flood and overcome the rest of the house. Uh, but the guy I worked for was just, you know, wonderfully inspiring and, and just very wise beyond his years. And I'll never forget when Only Revolutions came came out and he bought it and he read it and he, we had dinner and he's looking over it again. I mean, it's just a very literary cat, just, you know, you know, smarter than way smarter than me. And just, you know, just, just thrilled and aware of, of life and the world in which we inhabit. And he finally, you know, pay, he, he's, in, he's sitting there at the table, just thumbing through this thing. And he finally, he just closes it. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, what's going to happen. Many, many years from now, you're going to be living in some tiny place that you can barely get to. It's just going to be grown over with vines and thorns. And, you know, some young student is going to make their way through all those brambles and get to your front door. And he's going to be holding this book. And he's going to look at you and he's going to say, man, you were so ahead of your time. Yeah. That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, maybe it hurts to be first. <laughs> and he was right. He caught in. He caught in that. It's just like the, all the, you know, w what's good about it and what's so problematic is that you don't want to be too ahead of your time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I take that as a compliment and as a, as a good dose of reality because it's, um, and you know what, it, it is an important message to go out to, to, to get out there as well, because there are enormous potentialities in what can be done with narrative using, um, you know, using, uh, technology, uh, but it's still a cautionary tale. You know, one has to be be careful about what is what is available, um, and what you know what can endure. And and in some ways, my experience hasn't discouraged me, but made me think differently about the kind of narratives that I would want to present there. Yeah. You know, um, this kind of happened with the forums, uh, which are also being repaired from the hack, but. But with, uh, that were very connected to House of Leaves because, in some ways, constantly updating V Bulletin and enduring hacks broke, you know, broke threads and 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 eliminated pathways through the various conversations and reorganized the material. Uh, and that's the part that I love because that's very in keeping with the house itself. You know, that digital world is constantly reminding us of all the sort of shifting pathways that that, that house um, represents or enacts. That's an excellent perspective. <laughs> I'm going to go to a, a well, after that, what is going to be a very boring question. <laughs> um, so, so we've been doing this podcast for eight years. We've read a, a lot of books and, and we um, S by JJ Abrams. I think that's what it was called was probably the only one that, that, you know, um, was, was written in, you know, we'll call it a non-traditional novel format. Maybe. Um, have you ever considered, or would you consider writing a, a, a you know, straight book, every line, just typeset the way a normal novel is? I mean, I'd say The Little Blue Kite in some ways is the closest I've come to that. Uh, I, I think it's not a question of, I mean, again, with all, with all the books that I've written, they've never started as books. They start outside of that form. You know, they, I really look at them as, as they could be an art project. They could be a sculpture. Okay. If they, if they, if they seem to head in the direction of words, then okay. Is it, are they a poem or what, what exactly, you know, is the form that's going to, that it's going to take. And it's really kind of a marvelous experience. So I don't start on the outside and go, okay, I'm going to write this normal looking book and then kind of try to find an idea that suits it. It, it just, it's, it's not my process. Um, could I change that process? 
I mean, I suppose anything's possible. But, gentlemen, one thing I could say is that at 53, I, I see the limit of my years. And so, you know, a book takes, well, for me, it can take, you know, 10 years to three years. I think The Little Blue Kite is the shortest time span I've spent on a book. Uh, so that doesn't leave me with a with a lot of books left. Uh, and so I have to I have to choose wisely what my next project is. And I certainly am not going to make a choice that's based solely on a certain form. It's it's just it's not who I am at this point. So I guess that makes me think about like process a little bit. And you, you revealed it a little when you were talking about um, after having the idea of a little blue kite, there was, it sounds like there was a lot of not sitting in front of a typewriter going on. Is that pretty common for you? Like the, the, the story comes together through not just words on a page, but like more of an, not necessarily artistic, but creative process. I know that's, that's general. A, that's a great question. Um, and I think I, I didn't, I didn't do the sort of the history of, of how the little blue kite came to, to be, um, enough justice because there was also a great deal of writing. I mean, the, 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 the story on those plates expanded, you know, to, 10,000 words, you know, with, mm. there were different characters and then, and then, then it was, then it was cut back down. And, you know, so it was, it, there was, you know, a good chunk of writing that was involved with that book. Um, but I think what you're picking up and, 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 and what is accurate is that I believe that, that great expression needs to be cultivated outside of expression. So that means, you know, eating well, that means, you know, involving yourself in life well, you know, mm. um, you know, a, a, a sort of a physical practice that keeps you healthy. I, I think I probably end up sort of in a, in a place similar to an athlete that if I want to, if I want to think the best that I can and, and, and write the best that I can, how, how am, what do I need to pay attention to, you know, in my life in general? And, um, and so that's something that's, uh, that's constantly at work and, you know, which I embrace and fail at often and then get back and try to do better, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's a process and it's, uh, there, you know, there are exhilarating moments of success, but I think the, the, the more you get it, the more committed you become to a life that's rooted in a very narrow way of expressing oneself, whether the words are, are black and white or colored, uh, the less, you become the less involved you you become with 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 the moments of exhilaration or even the moments of 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 depression it, it really becomes about i guess enjoying just the factness of it all you know the 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 simple putting to get one word together after another taking them apart putting them back together and seeing how in these strange, quiet, you know, rearrangements, uh, suddenly something is captured that is far outside of the page, you know, and, and if I can somehow do that and offer it to a reader and they can, you know, encounter that arrangement and somehow be lifted more into the world, then I've succeeded. Um, but how I feel about it and, and, and whatnot is is irrelevant um, compared to that quest. It almost makes it sound like, and I could be way off here, but like um, from your own perspective, like you see a book in your life and you go back and like that makes you think of the whole process of like what your life was like during that period while that was going on, which that's, that sounds kind of cool. Like, like, like having a little touchstone for, this is where I was in the world when, when this thing was going on, I could be way off. <laughs> no, I think that's very true, but I also don't think you need a book necessarily sure. to do that. You know, you could have a record collection, you could have the books that you read, you know, yeah. I mean, we have many, we have many, you know, portals into our, into our 
into our past, into our life. And then it's just, it just requires being, you know, aware of them, I suppose. Sure. I will say those, I'm looking at them because I have a few books out here right now. <laughs> um, they are so complete into themselves that, that they don't care anything about my life. <laughs> like <laughs> like I, I can look at a little, you know, a little cat that, that someone gave me and I can remember the face of that reader, you know, um, when, when I was, you know, given this little gift and it's sitting on my shelf. But when I look at the familiar copy of House of Leaves or the Little Blue Kite, I really see the totality of that work. Like the work, the involvement when, of that work becomes so intense and so involved that I'm immaterial in its process. Mm, okay. um, and maybe in some ways, now that I'm thinking about it, that's one of the underlying stories for The Little Blue Kite. I mean, I know it's, you know, it is a children's book, and it is for, for parents who have children who have, you know, suffered the torture of, of repetitive readings that are just so <laughs> nullifying that, you know, hopefully that this will give them, you know, something to ponder because there is a, there's a great kind of, you know, there's a great connection that occurs when you're a parent, but also a kind of a great um, dissolving that occurs. You feel your own self just, you know, begin to vanish before the needs of, of, you know, of a little one. And so, you know, that's very much what the little blue kite is, is, is connected to, but it also is, as I think about it, uh, you know, about a creative endeavor. I mean, really mm -hmm. hadn't even really been thinking about it, but in many ways, I mean, you both know the story. It's like you start off with a project, a creative project, and it's, it starts off in pieces. And in fact, it doesn't even start in pieces. It's just shoved in the back of a closet and mm -hmm. it kind of haunts you. And it says like, hey, you got to come and do this. And finally you do it. And, and when you start it, it feels just wrong. It's hard to do. It doesn't really fly. But then eventually, you, you, the more you commit to it, the more you begin to loft this project higher and higher and higher. Um, and I still, um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know how to talk about The Little Blue Kite. It is so short that maybe we should talk fully about its story and avoid spoilers. But at this point, I'm kind of avoiding the spoiler. But you know where I'm getting, what, what I'm getting at, because what, what finally happens with a work is that, that the author, the creator becomes irrelevant and that it is ultimately purely about that work. And yeah. I think... I can I can vouch for everything that I've done that that is that is true for every single book that I've that I've published you know is that there is this moment where who I am who I was who I will become becomes absolutely irre irrelevant and it's a glorious feeling it really is all about um about the work itself and certainly that's the same for a parent i mean a generous meaningful devoted loving parent ultimately wants their child to be fully independent, fully in possession of his or her life and, and free to experience the world as we have. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's another way of looking at the little blue kite. <laughs> um, I had two thoughts during that whole thing. First of all, your, your guys' conversation about um, taking you back to a place. I was talking to my girlfriend earlier today about this interview, just like interviews at six and I've got get questions together, whatever. And she says, you know, you've been talking about this guy for like almost 20 years. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that sounds about right. And she said, she goes, I remember where we were when you bought House of Leaves. And she told me what bookstore we were at, which was not a bookstore we frequented all the time. She reminded me that we were very quietly and private fitly um heckling um poets that were there uh, it was an open <laughs> poetry thing and, and, and she said something really weird she goes I, I remember thinking we needed to get a ruler but i don't remember why so sometimes even the people who didn't read the book 
can can be affected by remembering a time. I just it was weird you guys were talking about that, and I was like, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, but I did have a question, and this is touching on something um, that you said very early on in about finally thinking of the little blue kite as complete. And your stories are very very intricate. Um, so I guess at any point after a book was was finished, and by finished I mean released in the hands of readers, have you ever thought? Uh, to yourself, you know, so we have a, a, a frequent um, friend and guest this podcast, David James Keaton, who has actually retroactively gone back and edited complete parts of ebooks that he published on, oh, wow. on Amazon because he had a better idea for a scene or whatever. Do you ever feel that? Like, is there a Sam and Haley story that you wish you could, you know, uh, flesh out more? Or is there, you know, Johnny Truant? Um, you know, a, a scene that, that came to mind, you know, after the book was completed and printed? Or, or do you let them go? Are they done once they're they're in print? Well, what do you think? You've just read The Little Blue Kite. <laughs> 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 I definitely let them go. I remember I remember being haunted by a by the story of an author. And I won't I won't say who that author was, who was known to go into bookstores, find find the book that plagued this author and uh, and pull it out and with a pencil begin to write in corrections. <laughs> wow. And I think I thought, you know, that's too far. There's there's a problem there. And um, so but that doesn't quite answer your question. I, I think it where there's inspiration, you have to go with it. And there are you know, in some ways, as different as my books are, there is kind of a unifying universe that kind of allows certain kind of, there's a certain porosity between the works that can can open up to encounters that might or might not be interesting with those various narratives. Um, whether I would go so far as to write about, you know, Johnny Truant doing something else, I don't know. You know, I I haven't been quite coaxed in that direction. I was sort of, I was considering it. I, I do sort of consider that potential, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at it at House of Leaves as a possible um, television series or looking at the 50 year sword and perhaps, you know, through the lens of a, of a movie, you know, what would happen if we met those orphans as they were adults and how would they talk about that evening, you know, in, in Texas and, you know, what layer would that add? So in that case, I'm kind of in, intrigued. And interestingly enough, they're in different forms. So I don't know what that says. You know, they don't, they don't speak to me in the form of, of another book, but maybe another medium, maybe even an electronic medium. Maybe that would kind of, you know, provide a kind of a, a brief window into something that we're familiar with um, and something that could potentially be doomed if that platform ceases to exist or that text becomes inaccessible. Um, one could sort of write a story that that you knew would, you know, would be short lived in a way. You have done such a great job of taking us right into like the next question. Sometimes we have to figure out how to like, you know, take something back. So uh, House of Leaves adaptation a little over a year ago, if I remember correctly, there was a pilot script that you released online. Um, is there any traction or do you have uh, thoughts on what you'd like to see out of that? I mean, I'm going to guess that you probably have this mapped out pretty well, just knowing your work. Yes, I, I did. And it's uh, I, 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 I put out a post a, a little while ago that's basically said the, the, the latest, you know, possible deal has not happened. So that puts me almost two and a half years in, in the hole in terms of, of, you know, dancing around a, um, a possible um, television sh series for House of Leaves. And, you know, I'm going to look at it probably one more time, but, it, you know, it's gotten to the point where as much as, as exciting as it would be, um, the amount of time it, it requires just to see if, if a deal could really produce a series is enormous. And I'm starting to look at, wait a minute, what's the next book I'm going to write? And as soon as I commit to that, 
then it really won't it really will be off the table because um, it's not something I'm I'm willing to just sell. And if I'm involved in it, it's going to take an enormous amount of work. So if I'm if I'm committed elsewhere, then it's then it's not going to happen. But it's it's still been intriguing. And um, in the midst of it all, I not only wrote the pilot, but I completely rewrote it and wrote three episodes of of a ten episode season one. And uh, as well as broke the season down and, and broke the subsequent seasons down. The way I see it now, it would probably it would probably come in at about five seasons with about eight to ten episodes each. Um, but in all fairness to the industry, um, you know, I'm I'm an unproven element, and uh, you know, as much as much you know experience as I have in in terms of studying you know film, and my father was a filmmaker. It really doesn't count. Like the industry wants to have people who can prove that they can deliver a show, that they can handle all the various, you know, personalities and deals and mishaps and, you know, have gained sort of a, a, a cons- constituency around them that will, will sort of make projects go. So it's, it's not enough just to say, oh, I'd love this director to do it do it. I mean, that director basically brings a whole set of people that, that people in the industry trust will deliver a product that is arable. Um, and in that sense, I'm just such an outlier that the only, the only likely way this would happen would be if I just decided to, to sell the project and, and walk away from it. And, um, you know, authors do that. They just say, Hey, here's the book. I'm you, you do with what you, what you can with it, but, um, it's not always, it doesn't always produce the best show. So, uh, I see a crossroads coming. So check in with me, you know, early next year and I'll, I'll let you know when I've decided, but I am pretty firm when I, when I do, when I do commit to, to a book, it's very much like a, a marriage and, uh, and that's it. I'm I'm devoted. So uh, <laughs> I think there's probably a few months, and then it will sort of live in the ether. I don't know. Maybe I'll put the three scripts, three episodes on Patreon or something like that, and <laughs> we can talk about the, I guess the 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 evolution of the pilot script to these scripts and and whatnot, and and maybe it'll maybe in some ways it'll it'll live as a as a series in people's heads. It'll be. Like House of Leaves, it'll be the series that just doesn't exist, but somehow people will have opinions about. I um I've ex- tried to explain to people, you know what what this book is, and and I, I was thinking while you were talking about, you know, trying to sell it or trying to sell you know uh, the the script, like there's no elevator pitch for that. There's no like quick three line thing. Like when I explain it to people, it takes me a good 10 minutes to explain how it's a story and a story (laughs) and a story about a film that doesn't exist. Like, you know what I mean? I can't imagine what it's like trying to, to lay something like that out for a, for a, you know, a a TV executive or whoever it is that, that you have to explain these things to. Let me ask you a question. How, how would you describe the feeling that House of Leaves or any one of my books gives you. I mean, like, what? Forget about the plot. Forget it. Forget about the characters. Like, what is the sort of the the tonality that you kind of latch onto? Oh, that's a good about? question. Um, I think that there's it, it, they're deeper, and this is you know kind of what you alluded to earlier. There's a depth there that that doesn't necessarily exist, and I don't want to say I've gotten deep into into some books. Um, you, tra- right. We'll say you know we'll call them traditional novels, but there's mm-hmm. a depth there um, that that makes it that gives it a, another dimension. You know, a second dimension. I don't know. I'm not a physicist. Maybe a second dimension, but there's definitely a depth there because of the additional. Um, the additional elements that are involved in all of them. I mean, House of Leaves specifically, um, you know, a little disorienting, maybe, mm-hmm. in a good way, um, trying mm-hmm. to find your way out of it. I've read it twice, once when it initially came out, and then subsequently uh, 10 years later, maybe. And um, even knowing where the book was going, I, I found that same slightly disorienting but immersive element in in, um, in House of Leaves specifically. See, I think that's the I think that's the elevator pitch. What you just said, I, I think <laughs> well, it's, there you go. 
it's less about the, the story. I mean, obviously it's important and it doesn't work without the story. But I think, you know, a series would be about that sense of, would capture through various media that sense of disorientation, you know. And there's probably a few other, you know, feelings there. But that kind of like there's a richness, there's a world that you're entering that you don't know the whole of. But what you're presenting is a series that kind of in a in a maybe in an exhilarating way, you said good way, you know, disorients you. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of, you know, and that's actually an interesting pitch because it's a very hard thing to do in television or movies. Um, but the, the certainly the book proves that it's possible. And you can't look at many shows right now that are streaming or airing that do that. I'm trying to think of, of <laughs> one. Do you guys have any? Examples? Yeah, that's. I, I, mean, I, I guess Westworld <laughs> sort of tries to get there, you know, with different narrative times. Uh, it, I, I, the, I don't even want to say this out loud. Um, oh, no, the DC Doom Patrol, which had a very, but it was also a very disorienting um tv show which one was it i'm sorry i didn't uh, hear you dc's doom patrol it's only available on no i haven't seen it yeah. yeah it's um i mean it's super super weird but yeah it has mm -hmm. that kind of disorienting feeling about it but that, that's the only one that came to mind like homecoming does it if you saw that with uh, julia roberts um directed by sam ishmael actually mr robot is has a certain quality it lends yeah. It, it it jars to an, in another direction, but it, it has those moments of kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Who's this? You know, um, but I think uh, I think that's a very valid experience because it what it kind of gets under. And, you know, this is these are the larger concepts of what I think is great, great literature, you know, great cinema, great television are those things that move beneath our deep set it deep set beliefs you know even our faiths because you know a lot of those they're they're sort of hot wired in us to to the degree that we can't get around them we can't we can't look at the origin of them we can't see that maybe it's trauma that determined these beliefs you know we can't we can't we can't see clearly that that certain sort of you know you know what misinformation has framed our our beliefs and that applies even to sort of you know the, the the political dilemmas that we're facing right now right now in this country but i think you know all great expression needs to deracinate which means to deroot us from some of these sort of sacred beliefs um which which we find great insur assurance in, but at the same time can blind us from from the reality of this world that we're inhabiting. And and certainly the little blue kite is just is committed to that. It's it's about letting go of those things that we think are so important. Um, and it's terrifying, and it's unforgiving in some ways, but. The promise that is out there, and it's a promise kept, is that when we really embrace the world as it is, this grand space that we are so fortunate enough to inhabit, um, that's when we really see the the wonders and and miracles of existence. I'm smashing into a, a much, much different topic um, in a very... <laughs> uh, uh, you know. Well, I should remind you, gentlemen, <laughs> our time is almost up, and yep. and there is a there is a there is a real <laughs> beautiful cause for 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 my 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 approaching exit, which is I have to go uh, see my little daughter and uh, and feed her dinner and put her to bed, and we will be reading the little blue kite. That's so. This is going to be a perfect because it's not even really a question, but like. Uh, uh, so since seeing, uh, you, when you were on tour for familiar volume one, every time I've thought about you or your work, I, I think back to the fact that during the Q and a session of that event, I've never seen an author be more, um, well-spoken and, uh, thoughtful about the process of the Q and a. So like someone would ask a question, 
you would repeat it back so that everybody in the audience could hear it before you answered the question. And I was so impressed that I, I won't shut up about it. It's stupid that like when I talk about you, I talk about your books, but I also talk about like what a great like live speaker you are. <laughs> and I needed you to hear that because it's it's a quality that a shocking amount of authors don't have when they're doing these live events. So um, I, I think people could could stand to learn from from your example. Thank you very much. Well, we have a tour coming up, and you know, I'm I will be out there. Who knows when I'll tour next? Uh, it certainly can be found on social media or whatnot. And I'm just disappointed that we won't be coming back to Chicago. But um, you know, we were equally we were equally disappointed. But thank you for doing this. This was amazing. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Usually we say the whole like, "Hey, it was great to talk to the." That's got to be top three interviews of the entire podcast i'd say yeah and we're not going to mention what the other two are so people can just wonder um our plan filling in filling in with your own top two or whatever that's right yeah (laughs) um our plan was to review this book Uh, it's been on our list for a while it comes out in uh in about a month now um but as you heard i don't think a we could do it any better justice than what was done there by Mark and and by Rob and not so much by me because I was too busy, you know, fanboying the whole time. <laughs> uh, but this is definitely a five star book. It is. Um, it, it's it, <clears throat> I was concerned. I was like, oh, it's kind of a children's book. And I thought, but, you know, I love the stuff Mark does. I'm gonna read it. You know what? There's no no cause for concern. It's a beautiful book. It's worth having um, on your shelf. It's worth sharing with the youngsters in your life. Even if you don't have any of those, I think there's a great story in there for adults, too, and something that we need to be reminded of um, occasionally. And uh, the way Mark does it is uh, is beautiful. So five stars for me. Uh, five stars as well. Yeah. What I'll say about it is um, I think it it's it's something that yeah can be experienced by different levels of, you know, age or whatever you want to say. But I, I could see me pu- myself pulling it out now. Like if I'm if I'm having a moment where I'm like, man. I, I really don't know, like, like I'm self, like self doubt or something like that. This would just be a quick little, like, uh, you know, kicking the pants to, to get me back to being focused and feeling positive. So yeah, definitely five stars. It's available for pre-order. I mean, I hate to say this cause I always pay so close attention to our guests and my co-host I actually pre-ordered and we have galleys. So I actually, when he told me about the, the finished product, I went ahead and pre-ordered one on Amazon. <laughs> it's available right now. And uh, it'll be in your hands uh, mid-November. So wow, that was awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. Like honestly, I, I just really and we we saw him uh, live at, at a reading. We talked about it in the interview, so you, you already know that. Um, and, and just the way that he articulates is just so fascinating that I knew this was going to be a great conversation. It's nice that we got to be part of directing that conversation so i it, you know it's it's great that we have that opportunity and i think that conversation was just amazing um so yeah yeah so um if you're a first time listener um welcome you can go back and hear us review the 50 year sword the familiar volume one um familiar volume uh, two familiar volume two um, I don't know i think i'm putting um only only revolutions the ipad now that i have an ipad um Maybe in my in my rotation to check out the, the <laughs> digital copy, but there's tons of other interviews, book reviews. We do this every week for the last eight years, and we'll probably continue doing it at least for a little while longer. So check out some other episodes while you're here. All right. So what we were supposed to be doing this week, and we re- rearranged mostly because um, otherwise we'd be doing the book review on my birthday, and Livius was way way too nice and, and gave me the option to take my birthday off. Um, next week we're going to be. Uh, posting our review of the John Horner Jacobs book, a lush and seething hell. That should be a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah, that was, uh, we did, we did an interview with John back in the day and we, uh, reviewed his book incorruptibles, which was part of a a series of, of books that had to do with, um, a world where machines are run by like demon. Uh, what is it? Infernal energy, some sort of demon Mm -hmm. energy. So, um, it's nice that we got to, it, it, this is another one of those authors we reviewed and talked to like five years ago that we're, yep. we're coming back around to. So, um, yeah, looking forward to talking about that book. That's coming up next week. Until then, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.